so boa tarde, buenas tardes, good afternoon to everyone. Mm -hmm. A pleasure to me in this afternoon to introduce Dr. Renato Simões Gaspar. Gaspar is a medical doctor graduated from the Federal University of Maranhão in Brazil. He completed his doctorate at the University of Reading in the United Kingdom uh, under the supervision of Professor Jonathan Gibbons and currently is working as a postdoc fellow at the Vascular Biology Laboratory and uh, at the Heart Institute of the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil under the supervision of Dr. Francisco Laurindo. Uh, his research interests include metabolic syndrome, changes in the female reproductive axis and platelet activation. Uh, in parallel, he conducts epidemiological research on various topics such as violence and the effect of income inequality on chronic non-communicable diseases. Renato, é um prazer ter você conosco nessa tarde, uh, particularmente para mim, que fui seu supervisor uh, durante toda a graduação. Renato is a former student of my laboratory mm -hmm. in Brazil, and so please go ahead. The word is yours. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcus. I thought on doing this in English just because I cannot speak Spanish and I thought it would be, you know, better for everyone involved. Um, so I've watched pretty much every single webinar before me and I must say it's an immense pleasure to be here today. It, it really is. Um, and I hope to share with you some of my research, but also some ideas that, you know, may or may not make sense, but hopefully will be food for thought. Uh, so this is the outline of what I'm about to talk today. I will start by touching on some theories that I think are relevant in terms of cardiometabolic programming and those theories will hopefully help us understand a bit better data that um, we've collected uh, linking platelets and dohard and hopefully you, you will also um, learn more about platelets and why platelets are the best cells that we have in our system and why we should all really like and really study platelets. I think they're awesome. <laughs> uh, then we will move on and I will talk a little bit of how I see evidence and how I think we collectively as a group could integrate and build different layers of evidence using different methods that may seem you know, completely apart from one another. I will elaborate a bit on that by talking a little bit of social determinants of health. So taking things outside of the lab and then into society as a whole. And hopefully we will be able to finish this talk, not with a conclusion, but with interesting questions for the future. Because I, I, you know, this is, this is my main goal here is to just generate questions that might be interesting for us to answer collectively. I could not start this without showing you this table. Now, before I go into the details of this table, right? So this is the table from the original Barker paper, paper published in The Lancet back in 1989. But before I go into the details of what he did, let me just reach out to the students out there um, because as a student, we always generate data and often most of that data is just negative is it's just not statistically significant and we think oh you know this is rubbish you know this is, this is not going to get me anywhere but look at this this is table one from david barker's original paper uh, a paper that sorry for the pun but the paper that gave birth to to Doherd in a way so to speak and they had just one small asterisk, just one small statistical significance that was actually quite relevant and gave birth to a whole field. I think that's quite interesting to note. And going into the specifics of what this table is showing us, what they did was they um, collected the standardized mortality rate of these diseases here um, from people from Hertfordshire in England 
and they backtracked their birth records and they correlated the weight at one years of age and then their birth weight with um, dying from these diseases. And basically what Barker did or found and, and his co-workers as well is, is that children that were very small or very light tended to die more from ischemic heart disease than children that were a bit heavier. That of course has been validated over and over again. A lot of people have done and redone that in different ways and the field has progressed a lot since 1989. We now know of different windows of intervention. We now know of different stimuli, different stresses, different components of that. And uh, we, we have some theories that may well try and explain some of those findings. And as we progress in the field, we are now trying to understand how it works. And uh, a great matter of research has been dedicated to understanding epigenetic drivers of these phenomena. I wanted to talk about two theories that I think will be relevant to the upcoming um, part of this talk. The first one is the economic saver theory. Now this has been talked about and explained way better before. Um, but basically what this, this theory says is that there are maternal stresses, let's say maternal undernourishment, that leads to a restricted intrauterine growth that then ends up generating a baby that's born small or that's born with low birth weight or preterm. And all of those things will program that organism to um, induce a catch-up growth. So overnutrition and which will then predispose the development of obesity. Those individuals tend to have more insulin resistance and develop diabetes at an earlier stage. They are also born with less glomeruli in their kidneys, which then increases their risk of developing hypertension. And all of those things increases the risk of having an ischemic event. So this is one of the possible explanations for that initial finding by David Barker. And as I said, as the field progressed, we generated different theories of different things that were going on. And one that I think is quite relevant to what we see in Brazil specifically, but also in various other countries, is the double hit hypothesis that basically says that we have sort of two big windows of intervention. One being the first hit, so things that happen to the parents or in utero, and the second hit, which is the second window, that would be things that happen to childhood all the way to early adulthood that would then predispose the development of ischemic diseases. So let me just give you one example. Sometimes these hits can go in different directions. So if you have, let's say, an undernourished mother swimming in one direction and you have an overnourished child, goes in different directions. So there is probably a dysfunctional adaptive response or programming that then increases the likelihood of developing ischemic heart disease. This will be quite relevant when we start to talk about platelets. But up until now, I've been talking about being born small and being born preterm and being born with a low birth weight. What we know now is that small and big are both bad. And this has been extensively discussed before and still is because it's quite something quite relevant in terms of public health. So being born small for gestational age or large for gestational age, both ends of the spectrum end up increasing our risk of developing cardiovascular events. I think that where we are now, we're trying to understand how. We're trying to understand how, which processes, which organs are being targeted, which pathways, and we have progressed quite a lot in this. So we know of organ architectural changes. We know of some epigenetic drivers. We know of some pathways, some cells that become dysfunctional. And I think that my small contribution to the field of Dohad has to do with trying to understand how does that offspring develop ischemic heart disease or ischemic diseases in general. And I think that platelets are an integral part of this equation. Now, I'm a platelet biologist, so I might be biased here, but, but please um, let me tell you a bit about platelets and 
this to me is the most beautiful definition of what platelets are and what they do, right? So platelets are a nucleate fractions of megakaryocytes that circulate in our blood. And basically what they do is they prevent us and stop us from bleeding. Now, this is quite an old observation made by this German pathologist back in 1874. And I take a step further in a way and say that because platelets do what they do i think that these cells are a remarkable evolutionary adaptation that's absolutely required for the human experience if we didn't have platelets or if we had the antecessor of platelets we would certainly bleed to death and you know that's not very pleasant is it um but how how do platelets work? You know, what, what is it that they do? So when they're circulating, they're normally resting. They're normally quiescent. And that's maintained by inhibitors being produced by the endothelium. When we have a cut or the subendothelium is exposed, platelets go and they stick to that and they call other platelets to form a thrombus or a clot. That clot then prevents us or stop us from bleeding, and then it's eventually absorbed by the vessel wall. Now here's the catch. When this, when there's too much of this going on, we start to have problems. We start to develop thrombi, we start to develop ischemia, we start to develop thrombosis. So targeting platelets is something that we, as a, a uh, in terms of medicine, are quite interested in. Why? Because cardiovascular uh, disease risk factors, things like obesity, hypertension, hyperglycemia, all of those things increase platelet activity. And perhaps because of that, they increase our likelihood of developing ischemic events. So just to illustrate, um, if you're a patient that has had a cardiovascular event or is in high risk of developing one, you take antiplatelet medications every day. So things like aspirin, clopidogrel, tecagrelor, those things. Um, so platelets are quite relevant to preventing and the development of cardiovascular diseases. But up until now, we, we didn't know if platelets were programmed. We didn't know if maternal inserts or offspring insults would be able to program platelets in any shape or form. And I think this is the small contribution that we have been fortunate enough to make. We investigated whether a high fat diet given to mum, to dams, or to the offspring would be able to program platelets. And the title gives it all. Um, basically, we found a phenotype that was specific to males. I will talk about this, but this is something I think should be looked further in, in more details. And this is, this is what we've done, right? So we had three week old female mice. We gave them a very high fat, high fat diet. So super physiological, this was a proof of concept study. Um, that diet was given before pregnancy, during pregnancy, and then during lactation. So sort of perigestational. And we separated those offspring into two groups, one receiving a control diet and one receiving a high fat diet. So we ended up having four groups in which the first letter of the group refers to the maternal diet and the second letter refers to the offspring diet. Those animals were then analyzed at 30 weeks of age, so kind of older. And this is what we found um, in terms of their metabolic metabolism and growth curve. Obviously, if you give a high fat diet to the offspring, that offspring then grows to be fat. That's no surprise there. But what I think is interesting here is, is the fact that um, high fat control animals tended to be a bit lighter towards the end of our analysis when compared to the control control group. And indeed, they also had, let's say, a bit better of a glucose tolerance test. So maybe there's some, some of that double hit hypothesis going on here, because if you think about it, you had an intervention in the mothers going one way, back to high fat diet, 
And then you have an intervention on the offspring going another way. That's the control diet. So maybe that um, was able to program that organism to become lighter, to become more efficient in metabolizing glucose. And we didn't look at that into much details, but, but one, one thing that we did was we measured the respiratory exchange rate. And the way that this works, you know, being quite um, brief, is if it's close to one, it means that that animal is burning more carbohydrates. If it's close to zero, that means that that animal is burning more fat. So you can see that the offspring high fat groups, they tended to burn more fat, which you know makes sense because they're given a high fat diet. But the high fat control animals in the middle of the night, they then swap their phenotype to burn more fat when compared to the control control group. So perhaps because of that, they have a, they are a bit lighter, you know, they are a bit you know, lighter than the control control group. In spite of that, they did not burn more energy, you know, compared to, to the control control group. I think this is something quite interesting and something that should be looked at in more details. And we can definitely talk about that. But something that we did not focus because we were interested in platelets, yes. And here they are. So these are platelets, right? This is an adhesion study in which we had a collagen ma matrix and we adhered platelets from animals of different groups to that matrix. As you can see, control control animals or animals that received a high fat diet only um, um, when they were born um, had sort of a normal platelet adhesion phenotype, right? So they were kind of similar. When we gave high fat diet to the mother, the platelet of the offspring adhered more. And that seemed to be potentiated when we gave a high fat diet to the offspring as well. So from this data, I can tell you that platelets are programmable. And that if you give a high fat diet to mothers or dams, in this case, mice, that then leads to a phenotype of platelet hyperactivation in the offspring that seems to be potentiated when you give high fat diet to the offspring as well. And that potentiation is perhaps more evident when we look at platelet activation. Now, this is a flow cytometry study. And basically what we're doing here is we are measuring how much fibrinogen is bound to the membrane of those platelets. And that occurs when platelets become activated. And we can measure that using fluorescently tagged antibodies through flow cytometry. We have activated platelets with different agonists. The first one is ADP, which is sort of a, a common agonist, you know, participates in different pathways. We also used CRP, which is related to collagen. And we also used thrombin, which is related to thrombin, uh, so different pathways. And as you can see, not all agonists led to the same response. So whatever it is that's happening in those platelets that's been programmed is specific to some pathways, but not others. And I think that's something that, again, we did not look at that further, but something that should be interesting to look at. How does it happen? Uh, one of the possible explanations is reactive oxygen species generation. So again, flow cytometry, what we did here was we gated the platelets and then we gated every other cell that I'm calling red blood cell population here just because they're more um, abundant. And then we use this dye called DCF, which fluoresces upon oxidation. And as you can see, um, DCF fluorescence was higher in all groups when compared to the control control group. And that was true for platelets and as well as for the other cells. So those animals were under an oxidative stress and perhaps that's part of the equation because they were under oxidative stress, their platelets were more active and, you know, Perhaps that's one of the possible pathways that's going on. As I said, that's a male specific effect. We did not look at this into a lot of detail, but what we did here was we found a similar metabolic phenotype for the females, a similar glucose tolerance test, but no difference in terms of their platelet reactivity, not even a trend, you know? So I don't know, are females protected? Uh, you know, I think this is something that's up for for debate, I think. So takeaway messages from this 
is, first of all, yes, platelets are awesome. <laughs> Second of all, that platelets can be programmed and there's probably a double hit effect going on here that leads to a platelet hyperactivation that's specific to males. And that probably has to do with the increased cardiovascular disease risk in those individuals. Are females protected? I don't know. It seems so, but I'm not sure. And what's happening to the megakaryocytes, which are sort of the father of platelets? We also don't know. These are open questions that should be looked at. Now, everything I've told you so far was done in the lab, in a controlled environment, in a box with animals that ate precisely what we gave them. But as my career progressed and I started to think about how we can integrate things from the lab to humans, which is some of the sort of the, the main goal in, in some of these studies. I started to think of the ways that we can build evidence and I started to think of different layers of evidence. So let me share it with you, um, this theory, this idea that I have. Um, and I will do that by giving you an example. So let, let, let's think about the platelet study, right? So let's think of a question and let's try and answer that question using different layers of evidence, so to speak. Um, can maternal obesity influence the likelihood of offspring developing thrombotic events? That's, that's the question that we're interested in here. How could we do that? Well, we could do an in vivo work. That's, that's what I did, right? And you know, that, that's valuable. We could generate an in vitro model. And to some extent, we also did that. That's also very good. We could do a population study in which we correlate or associate factors of the mothers with factors of the offspring. And, you know, that's also very good. That's also very enlightening. We could do a human study in which you, ha you have two controlled um, br branches of a study, and then we analyze those. It's also possible. But all of these things, and I, I really hope that you agree with me, all of these things fit into this box that is basically trying to understand the biology of what we're doing, which is, don't get me wrong, it's perfectly fine. You know, it's really relevant and we should continue to do that and we should, we should not change this. We should continue to try and understand the biology of things. And to do that, we use um, methods like flow cytometry. We talk about platelets and feedback loops and thrombosis models in this case. And we basically trying to understand the biology. But as I think about how to translate to humans, I cannot stop to think that that's, that's one layer of evidence, right? But there's, there's another sort of overarching layer that we don't think about very often when we do these type of lab works, which is sort of the subjective experience of being humans. Um, so things like stress or resilience or self-esteem, how do those things influence the biology and how does the biology influence those things? So I could think of a question here. So let's say, are obese pregnant women under more stress than non obese ones? And is that stress then linked to increased platelet reactivity? I don't know. You know, I think this is one possible question that would be very interesting to answer. And these are two layers of evidence that I think are important. But again, as I think about the human experience, we're not living in a box like a mouse. We're living in society. So there are things that go beyond our own individual psychological experience that are given, that we cannot control um, most of the cases, that may also influence our own subjective perspective, that may also influence our own biology. So do richer pregnant women, do they have less stress? And is that linked in any shape or form to a biological phenomenon? I don't know. Now, I think that there are different layers of evidence. 
And my goal is to try and answer a given question, a focused, specific question, using different layers of evidence. Is that possible? I don't know. <laughs> um, but I'm here to try and do that. And I think that that would be beneficial to try and integrate things and try and answer things in a more comprehensive way. Because in the end, the answer to their question might be more complete, so to speak. And to delve into that a little bit, I, and specifically on that outer layer of evidence, the social layer of evidence, I will now talk a bit about social determinants of health. And I wanted to start this with this amazing paper by people from the Federal University of Bahia, Fiocruz Bahia. They are very, very good epidemiologists there. Uh, it's, they're really good. And they have this cohort of the 100 million Brazilians, which sounds pompous, <laughs> but it's, it's actually very good science. What they've done here is they have associated different social determinants of health with the likelihood of being born small or being born large or gestational age. Now you can see that different determinants of health are associated with different um, likelihoods. I just wanted to bring attention to, let's say maternal schooling. So you see that less schooling is associated with a higher likelihood of being born small or large. So I think that's quite interesting. So how do we integrate that into stuff that we do in the lab? Another study that I wanted to bring attention to comes from people from Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil. And they've done something similar. They have, associ they have associated the likelihood of being born preterm with income of that family. So richer families tended to have a lower number of preterm births than poorer families. And that's consistent throughout different cohorts. But one thing that has been quite overlooked and one thing that's relevant not only to Brazil, but I think to Latin America as a whole, is not income itself, but the inequality of income. So the difference between how much one earns and how much the other earns. We know that income inequality is associated with health and social problems because countries that are more unequal tend to have more health and social problems. We know very little of how income inequality affects birth outcomes. There are a couple of papers perhaps, but not really an extensive study of how, how this is connected. And there are several theories that try to explain how income inequality is linked to the development of diseases. And I'm just gonna bring attention to two theories. So there is a direct effect and there is an indirect effect. The direct effect of income inequality on chronic diseases says that populations that are more unequal tend to also have poorer people. Because they are poorer, there's less access to healthcare. Because there's less access to healthcare, there's less material to access. They end up developing a worse health outcome. That's the direct effect theory. The indirect effect says that something along the lines of, if you're poor and you look over the fence and someone has a Ferrari, that generates a lot of stress in you. And that stress, that psychological stress, that social stress ends up increasing the production of hormones, things like cortisol, that end up increasing the likelihood of you developing a chronic disease. So in a way, this indirect theory integrates two different layers of evidence that I was just talking to you about. That's the social and the subjective perspective. And I think that's quite interesting. There are other theories as well, but just for the sake of time, I'm just gonna to stick to these two. And I'm going to share with you a study that we conducted um, that we were fortunate enough to get it done last year. Um, 
And what we did here was we associated income inequality with chronic health diseases in Brazil. Now, this is not specific to birth outcomes. This is not specific to mothers. But I hope you will agree with me that some of these findings will be interesting in terms of the programming perspective of income inequality. So this is, this is what we've done. We collected data from Brazilian states from 2002 all the way to 2017. Data were collected separately for male and female, men and women. And most of the data came from the Global Burden of Disease study. And we also had controls from um, official sources of the Brazilian government. And th this is the takeaway message of the study, right? Um, we stratified chronic diseases into more than 60 types of diseases because we think that each chronic disease is a separate entity. And I think that's the, the biggest um, trump of, of, of this work. What, what these graphs are showing you is, so on, on the y-axis you have the disease, and then on the x-axis you have the estimate, the correlate, the coefficient of that given disease, its association with Gini index, which is the index that we use to measure income inequality. If there is a positive association here, what this means is that increased income inequality is associated to increased burden of that disease. So you see, there is an increased burden of alcohol related diseases, and there is an increased burden of diabetes related diseases. And you see that it's different from men and women. So men seem to be more affected in some of these than women. Now, again, this is, this is the whole population. This is, this is not specific to pregnant women or fathers or newborns. But if you have a positive association between income inequality and diabetes in the overall population, I think it's reasonably to assume that perhaps something similar is also occurring in pregnant women. And what is the possible programming effect of that? We don't know yet. I think, again, this, this would be a very interesting question to answer. And then just, just to let you know that things are not black and white, we also found something that was not expected. Um, we found that increased income inequality was associated with a decreased burden of some mental health diseases. Why? <laughs> I don't know why. Um, I have some theories as to why. We can talk about that, but I, I don't know why. Why would a more unequal society also have a, a lower burden of mental health diseases? I, I don't know. But again, something that should be looked at into further detail. So this is the theory that we built. We think that income inequality affects the morbid mortality of chronic diseases through two mechanisms, essentially. The first one is the cycle social model. So again, integrating the social and the subjective perspectives. Um, and that's because income inequality leads to increased stress, leads to increased behavioral risk factors, and that then increase the propensity of developing chronic diseases. The other theory, the neo-materialist theory says that societies that have more income inequality tend to be poorer, tend to be um, have less income, have less access to healthcare, and all of those things precipitate the development of chronic diseases. But I think that the real benefit of this study was the identification of set-specific effects um, or gender-specific effects. So it's not the same for men and women. And, you know, the, there are possible explanations for that, cultural factors, social factors. Um, and I think that's something that should be taken into account as well when we think about these relationships. So to conclude in, in, some, in some way, well, to leave you with open questions, <laughs> um, I, I'm just going to, you know, just, just going to list a, a bit of uh, some questions here. The first one, going back to the platelet study, um, how do maternal forward slash paternal insults 
program mega carrier sites, which are the, fa the father of platelets? We don't know. I don't think anyone has ever looked into that. But if you are planning to do that, please let me know. I, I, would, <laughs> I would love to get involved in that, uh, that type of study. Uh, the second one, and I think this is quite cool to think about, do people born small or large for gestational age? Do they need to take antiplatelet medications sooner than normal weight birth? And we are in this era of individualized, personalized medicine. How can we integrate DOHAD into that? Um, maybe the answer is no, but maybe the answer is yes. Again, I think this is something that is quite interesting to look at. Are females protected from cardiovascular events due to maternal insults? Some people say no, other people say yes. I say, I don't know. <laughs> but again, something that would be very much interesting to look at. How do social determinants of health affect birth outcome? And specifically, how does income inequality affect birth outcome? There are perhaps one or two papers, but nothing extensive. And um, I think there's a lot of room here for us to understand these associations. And finally, how can we integrate findings? How can we integrate different layers of evidence to try and answer one given question in a more comprehensive way? Is it even possible to do that? I don't know. I think, I think it's in part my job to test whether or not it's possible. But again, I think this would be something very interesting to think about and um, to, to study in the future. I could not finish this presentation without saying thank you. Um, so I will take this opportunity to thank people back at Reading. So uh, most of the work that I've presented here was done there. I want to thank Marcus, my scientific father in many aspects. Uh, my current supervisor at OSP, Chipu, and Tom at Imperial. Um, Tom has actually taught me a lot about epidemiology and epidemiological work, and he's, be, he's been integral to, to some, of, some of the work that I've presented here. Oh, and, and of course, I want to thank FAPESPI for paying my bills. <laughs> I think that's also very important. But there are two individuals that I cannot forget to mention because they have helped me when making this presentation, when rehearsing this presentation, and they've just been with me every step of the way. And I wanted to really thank my dogs. <laughs> I, think, I think they're really important to me. So the, the white one is Shiku, uh, you know, and, uh, and the crazy one is Maju. <laughs> so yeah, so thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Well, let's see. Uh, I don't know you are listening to me. I guess my, uh, can you hear me? Yep. My screen is frozen. Yes? Okay. Yes. So, Renato, thank you so much for your outstanding presentation. And so we this? have time. Uh, uh, yes, it, it's better. Thank you. Uh, and so now we'll have time to some questions mm -hmm. from the out. Uh, great, great thing in these webinars. And as you currently do, uh, the people can ask in any language, of course, between Portuguese, Spanish, and English, they, they want. And you can answer in Portuguese or in English, but if you can answer in Portuguese, I think it would be better, particularly for uh, Latin American students, uh, you know, and I just want to ask you to do it in a slowly way, okay, so that people can understand you much, much, much better, okay? So uh, we have some questions here in the in the chat. 
but I will start with Dr. Paulo Matias, who raised his hand. And so please, Professor Paulo, go ahead with your question. Paulo, are you there? I don't know. Hello, 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 hello. Hello, Paulo. Okay. Um, can you hear me now? Okay. So, uh, first of all, I have to say thank you to, to, to Renato for your talking. Uh, very, very teaching us. But my, my question, Renato, is you, you, you can uh, answer this question. Do you think that we have enough data uh, regarding social factors to, you know, to, to grow, to, to, to support the Dohaj concept? If yes, I, I want that you, you know, it's not, you, you, you not to, oh, uh obligated to to answer the question but uh, why the government not apply not uh, conduct uh, a massive uh, public uh, health policy to use this data or we don't have yet enough data to support uh, uh, you know, to equal, equity, uh, equality, uh, social, uh, you know, uh, stuff to in our society, mostly in Latin America. I think that, yes, we do have enough data to support the Doha concept. In my personal opinion, the reason why we are so ineffective in doing so comes down to one word, and that's lobby. Um, so when we think about um, uh, smoking, we had a big lobby to tax cigarettes and, you know, to change policies and implement laws and all that. Maybe, I don't know, I, I, you know, I, I'm not aware, but maybe there is a lack of communication with politicians and that communication is often achieved through lobby. Lobby is not always bad. Lobby is just influencing policy. I don't know. I mean, I think that's one possible answer. Ok, thank you. Obrigado, Paulo. Obrigado, Paulo. Okay. Uh, para um pouco, então, com as perguntas do chat, eu vou, então, ler... Uh, a gente tem duas perguntas que talvez vão em uma direção muito parecida, do professor Egberto Moura e da professora Patrícia Boer. O professor Egberto diz é, que ele está curioso com relação a como que essa... É, iniquidade pode, então, afetar a agregação plaquetária e que talvez uh, estudos futuros possam, então, uh, apontar uh, mecanismos nessa importante nova área de estudo. Isso talvez combine um pouco, Renato, com a pergunta da professora Patrícia, que diz, então, se os megacariócitos realmente são programados ou se eles apenas respondem aos efeitos metabólicos hum. da programação. Uhum. É, eu vou começar pelo final. Eu acho que, por muito tempo, a plaqueta e a forma como a plaqueta se ativa foi vista como uma consequência. Talvez pelo fato dela não ter núcleo. Então, a pessoa desenvolve diabetes... E por que ela desenvolve diabetes, ela tem problema de ativação das plaquetas. 
Isso aqui tem uma consequência. Mas hoje, né, uh, talvez até por isso a plaqueta tenha sido tão negligenciada, né? o campo de plaqueta é um campo muito pequeno ainda. Mas hoje a gente consegue entender que a plaqueta ela também está envolvida na fisiopatologia, no desenvolvimento de algumas doenças, como, por exemplo, diabetes. Então, a gente sabe que é, pâncreas de pacientes pré-diabéticos têm maior acúmulo de plaquetas que se ativam lá, que soltam seus transmissores e que isso, então, danifica aquele órgão que propicia o desenvolvimento do diabetes. Então, será que os megacariócitos são programados ou será que eles são uma consequência das programações metabólicas? Não sei, eu não sei. Eu acho que, eu acho que essa é uma pergunta fundamental né? no, dentro desse campo de programação cardiovascular. Né? Eu acho que pode ser as duas coisas, na verdade. Mas eu acho que isso é muito interessante. E quando a gente pensa em integrar esses aspectos sociais a função plaquetária, por exemplo, desigualdade de renda, por exemplo, a própria Covid, que gerou mais desigualdade de renda, enfim, políticas públicas que geram mais desigualdade de renda. Na minha opinião pessoal, eu acho que aquela teoria psicossocial, que é a teoria que diz que a pessoa, quando pobre, e percebe a, o, a, a sua escassez de recurso, que ela tem um nível de estresse maior, eu acho que, por isso, ela geraria, então, produziria mais hormônios de estresse que, então, levariam aos desfechos biológicos. Eu acho que, na minha cabeça, essa, essa é a via de comunicação que faz mais sentido. Então, seria pela regulação hormonal daquela pessoa frente ao que ela encontra no dia a dia da sua vida ali naquela sociedade. Muito obrigado, Renato. É, de alguma maneira, me parece que você antecipou a resposta para a pergunta feita pela professora Glória Barbosa. A professora Glória tinha justamente perguntado se a pandemia da Covid-19, então, poderia ser um determinante social para a programação em plaquetas. Acho que um pouco você respondeu, não sei se você quer complementar Alguma coisa, Renato? É, não, não, eu acho que é isso, sim. Eu acho que, com certeza, pelo ponto de vista da desigualdade de renda, com certeza. Mas eu acho que do ponto de vista da doença também, sabia? Porque a gente não sabe ainda exatamente quais são as repercussões que a Covid na gravidez tem no desenvolvimento daquela prole. Né? Será que a maior inflamação que, causa, que é causada pela doença, né? Então, geraria algum tipo de desbalanço daquela célula, eu acho que isso também é algo importante. Talvez uma coisa que é sempre importante de lembrar é que os eventos tromboembólicos estão no top 3 de causas de morbidade no mundo. E quando a gente fala em eventos tromboembólicos, a gente pensa em endotélio, a gente pensa em reatividade vascular, do ponto, quando é para estudar, a gente pensa em uma série de fatores, mas as plaquetas elas estão sempre ali meio que um pouco negligenciadas, como você, como você colocou. Ou seja, é, talvez as plaquetas ainda sejam o que as células endoteliais foram por muito tempo. Por muitas décadas a gente pensou as células endoteliais apenas como aquela estrutura que servia para reduzir o atrito contra a parede do vaso e depois uhum. a gente depois da chegada do óxido nítrico a gente descobriu um universo gigantesco em relação às células endoteliais pode ser que seja um pouco isso uh, eu não sei se a Inácio do Renato está congelada Renato você está aí ainda estou aqui espero Muito que espero bem. que ainda esteja aqui tudo bem tudo bem né? porque a tua <risos> imagem para mim está parecendo como congelada uh, professor Bernardo Krause, por favor, a sua pergunta. Muito, uh, thank you very much, Marcos. Uh, uh, and thank you very much, Renato. Uh, really an amazing uh, presentation. I, I have a, a small comment about programming, but the, and, and, and about the, the point that raised 
uh, Professor Macia, concerning how, why uh, this evidence can, can, has not been translated into uh, public uh, health uh, policies or, or, or something like that. And I think that one problem is that uh, we are, as Doha community, we are just looking at ourselves. And there's so other uh, research areas which are quite interesting looking at this uh, issue. I have been working with people involved in adverse circle experiences, which was raised in the 90s by Felitti Ananda from Kaizen Permanente. And then comes a, a complementary data to your uh, talk uh, and could be, uh, be part of the discussion because we are looking at epigenetic determinants uh, related with adverse childhood experiences. I mean, uh, not only being poor, but also have a parental uh, violence uh, and all the social uh, constraints. And we have found that the most sensitive system that we have said is not, for example, the, the nervous system, is the immune system. Mm. And it seems like the cells are also responding to stress. So mm. have, have, you connect, uh, have you found some connection with this ultra uh, function and some uh, immune-related uh, alteration? And other point, because obviously they are quite related, have you tried to isolate a uh, megacarocytes or, or circulating a uh, platelet precursor to see if there are any content that can be uh, preclude the alter function of these platelets? Hmm. Yes, um, I think it's really relevant what you're saying because, as Marcus said, um, platelets are neglected and i don't understand why because they are awesome <laughs> but they have been neglected and platelets are known for making thrombi or at least that's what we thought but over recent years platelets have become even more an immune cell so we know that platelets phagocyte we know that platelets signal to other immune cells uh, and that's probably something that's relevant to the context that you were talking about, about uh, adverse reactions. So probably there, there's some sort of plated involvement there because they have all the right receptors, they have all the right machinery to respond to immune events. And answering your second question, I think that the, the, the short answer is yes. <laughs> yes, I have tried to do that. Yes, we have isolated megakarya sites. We have done that. But as, as it often occurs with the scientific stuff, it, it just didn't work. <laughs> so uh, our methods were flawed, right? So I was able to isolate the megakarya sites. I was able to have a look at them, but I couldn't answer any questions because of methodological errors. So I, I don't know exactly what's going on in the bone marrow. But again, I think this is perhaps one of the most interesting questions in terms of how platelets become reactive and programmed. Thank you again, thank you. Obrigado, Bernardo, por tua pergunta. Renato, temos uh, várias manifestações de congratulações pela tua palestra aqui no chat. O professor Carlos Grande, uh, nosso colega, que eu acho que a gente já pode dizer meio argentino, meio brasileiro, de tanto que tem estado pelo Brasil, correto, professor Carlos? É, te pede se você pode depois compartilhar conosco a referência do teu estudo que está no The Lancet Americas, então... Se você puder me mandar depois o PDF do artigo uh, via uh, rede de correio do Doha, do La Doha, a gente manda então o trabalho para todos os nossos membros, para todos os nossos associados. Tudo bem? Com certeza. 
Ok, eu não sei se nós temos mais alguma pergunta aqui. Perdão se eu deixei passar alguma. Se alguém quiser fazer mais alguma pergunta, alguma pergunta final. Uh, se não, eu então é, encerro essa sessão. Ok, Patrícia Boer, por favor. Oi, eu fiquei com uma dúvida, que é a seguinte, é, é, é lógico que é difícil, né, você realmente demonstrar isso, né, que está havendo uma formulação das plaquetas, é, o que você está pensando, então, é que teria uma programação que seria feita nos megatariócitos do feto, é isso? E aí isso, através, então, da, da fragmentação, essas outras, essas mensagens estariam nas plaquetas, né? Exato, as plaquetas elas carregariam, né? Dos é, você poderia traçar um paralelo disso com a possibilidade de a gente ter as microvesículas? Hum. Sim, é. Inclusive, é. inclusive, engraçado, né, você comentar isso. Uh, um dos trabalhos que eu fiz no doutorado foi exatamente com microvesículas de plaquetas. Uh, então, uhum. assim, essas, as plaquetas, elas produzem microvesículas quando elas se ativam, como várias outras células também o fazem. E me parece que existe um sistema, não sei se parácrino ou se vai mais longe do que isso, mas existe um sistema de comunicação entre essas microvesículas da plaqueta e diferentes células. Então, por exemplo, a gente sabe que as microvesículas das plaquetas impactam nos rins e impactando em algumas células dos rins precipitam uh, algumas disfunções renais também. Então, com certeza, é, talvez as micropartículas, né? no caso, o pessoal de micropartícula nem gosta de chamar de micropartícula, né? eles preferem que chama de vesícula extracelular, talvez a vesícula extracelular seja a forma que essas células têm de se conectar. Né? Com certeza. Eu fico meio, até meio assim, atordoada, né? em pensar é. nisso, porque se imagina plaquetas liberando vesículas, e mais todas as células liberando vesículas, e essas vesículas todas né, agindo, Quer dizer, novo mecanismo, né? Que a gente parece que é infindável, é. né? Uma quantidade de mecanismos que é, é, é uma... muito difícil de decifrar, né? É, é verdade. <risos> Obrigada, Renato. É que agradeço. Bom, é, por... Obrigado, Patrícia. É, por favor. Egberto? Oba, o Renato, parabéns aí. É, agora, com a, essa pergunta da Patrícia, eu, eu pensei uma coisa aqui é, em relação à dengue, por exemplo. A dengue, ela diminui muito o nível de plaquetas, mas algumas pessoas respondem com uma queda abrupta, outras não têm a dengue e, e o número de plaquetas continua. Isso nos faz pensar que poderia ser uma espécie de programação, né? Quer dizer, se, se, dependendo... Do, de, de como você foi programado, suas plaquetas responderiam a uma infecção viral, por exemplo, como a dengue, de formas diferentes. E isso é válido para outras coisas, né? doença cardíaca lá e tudo. Então, assim, é, você pensaria em desenhar algum experimento em que a gente pudesse avaliar essas diferentes respostas a um segundo insulto, né? o segundo VIT, é, é, de acordo com uma programação prévia, né? E eu gostei muito de um estudo teu sobre violência. Talvez depois pudesse, eu acho que foi citado aqui, não sei se foi o Carlos Grande, a, a violência... A, não, foi o, o Krause, né, o Bernardo? A, a violência podendo ser também um fator importante na programação. Né? Mas parabéns aí, Renato. Valeu, obrigado. Não, com certeza, eu acho que essa é uma hipótese que eu nunca tinha pensado sobre, né? E eu acho que falando, né, ouvindo você falar, eu acho que algo faz muito sentido. Quer dizer, será que uh, existe alguma forma de programação das plaquetas que faz com que elas expressem mais um tipo de receptor específico, que é o tipo de receptor que faz com que as plaquetas sejam é, metabolizadas, né, ou, pelo, pelo baço, né, sobretudo? Uh, e será que isso, então, propicia... Uh, a diminuição do número de plaquetas frente a algumas doenças virais, eu acho que essa é uma pergunta, assim, 
em aberto ainda. Eu confesso que eu não tenho muita experiência com uh, doenças infectocontagiosas, mas tem algumas pessoas, sobretudo aí do Rio de Janeiro, <risos> são muito boas. <risos> Talvez a gente pudesse pensar em alguma coisa. Obrigado. Obrigado, Renato. Eu agradeço. Você está mutado, Marcos. Obrigado, Renato, por avisar. Obrigado, Egberto, por tua pergunta. Então, mantendo a nossa proposta de que as nossas sessões têm uma duração máxima de uma hora entre apresentação e sessão de perguntas e respostas, eu, então, encerro uh, essa sessão agradecendo mais uma vez ao Renato por sua disponibilidade de conversar conosco aqui hoje. É importante que se mencione que ao longo desse ano, imagino que todos estejam me entendendo, estou tentando falar devagar para todos entenderem. Ao longo desse ano, a gente pretende trazer alguns outros pós-doc ou trainees, porque acho que é importante a gente fazer essa oxigenação e ver um pouco como que os nossos jovens pesquisadores estão estão pensando. Então, a gente já tem uma outra apresentação de treinir uh, escalada para o mês de agosto, mas no próximo mês, em maio, a gente terá o prazer de receber aqui, nessa nossa sessão, a professora Carol Leandro, da Universidade Federal de Pernambuco, que trabalha muito bem com programação e esporte, e que vai, com certeza, nos dar uma excelente, uma excelente palestra. Então, Renato, parabéns mais uma vez pela carreira que você tem construído até aqui, parabéns pela excelência da apresentação que você nos deu hoje, a todos os nossos colegas brasileiros, latino-americanos, de fora da América Latina, muitíssimo obrigado pela presença de vocês em mais esse... <risos> Então, uma boa tarde a todos, muitíssimo obrigado, buenas tardes, good afternoon to everyone. Bye-bye, my friends. Bye-bye. Tchau, tchau.